This is Dr. Jerome Corsi, and today is Wednesday. It's November 15th, 2023. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we've lost electricity here, and so therefore this is going to be a little bit of a uh, different broadcast. We were not able to post a, a, or prepare as much given just all the difficulties and no electricity. What it reminds me, though, and I want to, I've thought about this frequently, is what would the world be without electricity? And again, that's uh, part of the fundamental themes of this whole climate change movement is that we're going and engineering a, a world in which we're going to have much higher energy costs and much less reliable energy. Uh, we, we have had a period of time, in the post-war period in the United States, where we've had great stability in terms of the systems. Uh, we had electricity, we have running water, we have roads that work. Uh, fundamentally, we've done great advances in progress since the end of World War II. Now, that's not necessarily going to maintain itself. It's not necessarily going to continue at the same level. You know, if we have, uh, there's a good, the broken light bulb or the flash, I mean, if we end up deconstructing the electric grid we've created or, or destroying it in any fundamental way, uh, we're, gonna, we're going to suffer as a consequence, a dramatic change in our lifestyle. Once the electricity is gone, you'd be surprised that nothing, nothing functions. You know, your refrigerator is not going to function. You're not going to be able to make coffee in the morning unless you have gas stove. So the fundamental changes occur is the moment you don't have the, the things you assume are going to be there and are unconsciously assuming you are readily available, which they're not in nature. Electricity is not going to be readily available without a massive investment in a grid, maintain, maintain, maintenance of that grid, and the... Um, a political direction in which it's understood that going to renewable fuels or going to a direction where we have uh, less meat, uh, all these things that the negative uh, climate change movement wants to do are going to ultimately affect lifestyle around the globe. And I want to cover two stories first, and they're kind of going to set the stage for the what I want to talk about today. The uh, first story, story has to do with Europe. This is a story that was uh, published in a publication of the, uh, and I can't stop the cl clinging necessarily as much today. I'm going to try to stop some of those beeps with put on do not disturb, but uh, essentially we're running on my cell phone for the internet connection. So the story about Ur Europe burning is a story that uh, has been developed, comes out of the Claremont Institute, one of their publications. It's authored by uh, John Kotkin. Now, what he's saying is that uh, Europe, for since the beginning of the United States, going back to the 1700s, Europe was always regarded as the high civilization. You know, it was largely Christian. It had uh, great cathedrals, museums, a style of life, old, charming cities, uh, and a, a the people had good food. Now, it was not necessarily the most advanced in terms of going in the 1700s. Nothing was much advanced. We didn't have the fundamental conveniences of life that we have today. Electricity did not come on for a while. The, the electricity was really not a phenomenon in, across the United States until uh, the 1900s. It was urban electrification was going on in the 1930s. We forget how recent a lot of these developments have been. But what's going on in Europe today is not the same model that it was before. This largely this globalist nation, this uh, the Mitterrand advisors and uh, going back to Jean Monnet and the European Union, this globalization, which was predicated on neo-Marxist ideas and the idea that we could be one world government. Okay, I've been fighting this much of my political career, my writing career. And uh, what we're seeing is that Europe today is suffering from all of these negative impulses. 
So a common theme in the early years, in the, uh, 19, after World War II especially, uh, the uh, whole idea was that you could merge the European economies together, you could create a United States of Europe. But the problem is that the Europeans today are unwilling to maintain their industrial state. They won't control their borders. Uh, the uh, European countries are essentially weak today compared to where they were even 200 years ago. And the, the demographics are dismal because now you've got an influx of a largely Islamic population that is not assimilating into European cities. You've got class, you've got enclaves within these cities of poverty that are not necessarily even Islamic, but they may just simply be a middle class has fallen out of the middle class. In the United States, the same thing is happening. We're getting cities that are now dominated by homelessness. And I see that Governor Newsom is cleaning up San Francisco because President Biden is going to be meeting there with Xi from the uh, China. That, that's, so now for that meeting, they're saying, well, Xi, these are very important people coming in for an international meeting. We better get the homelessness out of the way. And uh, Jake Sullivan was asked at the White House, you know, one of the advisors on foreign policy that I think is one of the most negative, you know, is it more important to impress Ch communist China than the people who are paying taxes every day and living in San Francisco? So the problem is that we're really seeing a deconstruction of, of modern civilization. There's a fundamental shift going on right now, a demographic shift, and we're seeing more of the poorer countries moving into the Europe and into the United States. The influx of the Hispanics into the United States is dramatic. Uh, I happen to think, I mean, and none of it is regulated in terms of legality. We're not taking care to make sure that these people are um, not criminals. Now, I'm, I'm welcoming the Spanish coming into the country. I think it's actually going to revitalize the country. These people still believe in God, and they still form families. What's really hurting Europe and the United States is that people are becoming totally secular. The belief in God is gone. Without the belief in God, things begin to deteriorate very rapidly because if, if everything is just about a temporal existence here, this place is difficult. Earth is hard. Every day you've got to eat. Every day you've got to sleep. And so we're now saying that we're going to have uh, electric vehicles, and we're going to have wind turbines, solar panels. Well, all these things can produce some energy. The electric vehicles, if you're not going very far, just going around in a city may work. But for any robust multi, you know, a multinational world where you've got modern industrial society being the standard that sustains life in that world, you cannot go to a more expensive, less powerful form of energy without, in fact, killing and destroying millions of people. Uh, Chris, do you want to comment on this? I want to uh, highlight the book, and then I'm going to go to kind of a deep dive in a couple of my uh, books here with the, highlight these themes, and I want people to understand that this is not accidental. This is a planned de deconstruction. It is a planned depopulation movement. Chris, you want to comment? I thought about this because you, you sit here and, and watch these, um, these city mayors destroy their municipalities and keep getting elected. It's almost like they, they know that their constituents would vote, I'll, I'll use that phrase, blue no matter who. Any, anything with a D behind it would get elected at these places. It's probably, for, it's probably out of fear and out of uh, complacency. But what's happening now is these people seem to be commissioned in a way, or at least it seems to be their duty to destroy the cities uh, and thereby hurting the nation's economy as a whole over and over. Uh, it's as part of the great reset. The idea is to kneecap the stronger nations to bring them down to the weaker nations rather than strengthen the weaker nations to make them, um, to, to help to allow them to catch up to the rest of the world. Um, what's going on is the world economic forum, the Klaus Schwab idea that, uh, that the, let's just say the more advanced nations should find a way to set themselves backward 
to co to uh, kick the Great Reset in and make people more open to that, uh, lower the standard of living overall, uh, it is working. And people are falling for it. People are just allowing this to happen. Not only that, they're actively voting for it. That's what's going on. Uh, okay, it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but watch what's happening. And listen to the, uh, the words of these elitists who are driving around in their, their private planes flying to Davos and talking about how the world needs to, or the first world needs to, and I've heard them say it, lower their standard of living. Well, I, I wanted to focus on Harrison Brown for a minute, who wrote a book called uh, The Challenge of Man's Future. And I cover it right here in this book, The Truth About Energy, Global Warming, and Climate Change. It's the first in a series of three books I'm writing, a trilogy on the Great Awakening. Here's the second book. I want to highlight a few features out of these books right today. And then we'll, we'll get to the free book, which is the underlying theme of this whole meeting, this whole presentation this right here the coming global crash will create an historic gold rush you get this book free from uh from swiss america and i think we're we're entering into a very dark period economically uh globally 1-800-519-6268 get the free copy of the book i repeat that number swiss america call them and talk about gold the uh, value of the dollar is going uh down in terms of purchasing power 1-800-519-6268 get a free copy of how the coming global crash will create an historic gold rush uh, the world banks are, are buying gold at an all-time high rate and they are knowing that the value of currency all the fiat currency and the debt we have in the world is going to crash not sure what date it'll crash on but uh, it's it's in the process of crashing now Holdren, okay, I want to go into this 1954 book. Chris, I'm sure you can find it. The I've got one up here on my shelf, but I'd have to go get it. The Challenge of Man's Future. I think we found it. <laughs> Good, work. Good work. Harrison Brown um, was a nuclear physicist. He worked on the Manhattan Project, and he was followed up by John Holdren, who became Obama's science czar. Now, Holdren, uh, and Holdren is one of the key figures responsible for the climate change movement because Holdren developed this entire theory that uh, we have carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. And in the industrial age, we started burning hydrocarbon fuels, which emitted greenhouse gases. And therefore, we are warming up the planet by industrial activity. Human beings are the cause of our own destruction, is one of the underlying themes of this entire movement. Now, uh, in high school, Holdren read Harrison Brown's The Challenge of Man's Future, which was a book that we had, we we're running out of resources. There were too many people, not enough resources, and that if we didn't have world government to control populations, we would have a disaster, a Malthusian disaster. That's the type of thinking that is depopulationist. In other words, we want to eliminate people so only those privileged can can continue to live, those who are worthy of living. It, it's really a form of eugenics, very much like the Nazis engaged in. The Nazis felt that people who were retarded or people who were Jews or any number of other homosexuals didn't deserve to live. They were subhuman. They wanted to create a superhuman race, the ubermensch, as Nietzsche said, the above man. So when Harrison Brown wrote this book, he uh, was proclaiming that we should have birth control, we should regulate the number of children and families allowed to have, uh, we should uh, have world government to impose these standards everywhere. When um, Holdren, John Holdren, in high school, read Harrison Brown's 1954 book, uh, he um, decided it was one of the turning points in his life. In a, in a 1986 book that Holdren put together, a volume of essays dedicated to Harrison Brown's lifetime of work, Holdren said, by the time I read Harrison Brown's book as a high school student, the book had been widely acclaimed as a monumental survey of the human project, illuminated through analysis of the interaction of population, technology, and the resources of the physical world. So I knew that even before high school, that science and technology held a special interest for me. And I 
Suppose I had some prior interest in the larger human condition, but Harrison Brown's challenge of man's future pulled these interests together for me in a way that transformed my thinking about the world and the sort of career I wanted to pursue. Now, Harrison Brown uh, abandoned physics and was do, writing a series of books. And Holdren, who was a plasma physicist in his early career, he abandoned it. A nuclear, it was a very advanced form of nuclear physics, dealing with fundamentally how the sun produces its, its, own, its energy and light. And um, what Harrison Brown did is he transitioned to uh, start working with uh, Paul Ehrlich, who had written a book called The Population Bomb. And um, he became Obama's science czar and advanced this whole idea of this geoengineering. You know, he wanted to have these ships that produce steam sail the ocean so that we'd have more clouds to block the sun. Uh, and he decided that he would go to um, uh, develop this whole idea of global warming, but by combining with Paul Ehrlich, the whole ecological movement turned from really concerned about being good husbandry, good working with the earth to maintain the earth, to a, let's get rid of the people. There's too many people. Okay, now that is a theme that runs throughout the uh, this whole climate change movement until it morphed into it morphed into communism because the green movement finally embraced uh, reimagining capitalism. Okay, so the original movement to reimagine capitalism was traced back to the uh, U.S. labor movement in the twenties and thirties, nineteen thirty-five. Uh, the passage of the uh, National Labor Relations Act, the Wagner Act, established collective bargaining. Okay, so then in the 60s and 70s, Daniel Bell, with books like The End of Ideology and The Coming of Post-Industrial Society, introduced the notion that capitalism itself had become outmoded beyond reform. Bell's post-capitalist vision inspired corporations to have a moral responsibility beyond profits and beyond those are the, meeting the needs of the workers to address the uh, economic interests of those less fortunate in society as a whole. So these movements that developed, Marx thought we would have a workers of the world revolt in the 1800s to abolish private property and to move into a utopian communist world. No one would own anything and everybody would be happy. It's the same theme you hear from Klaus Schwab today in the, in the World Economic Forum. The labor movement improved the conditions of people who were working, but then by the 1960s and 1970s, we began to question again capitalism as an economic system. This is at the same time that the attacks are increasing on capitalism as a culture to undermine the culture of capitalism. And the shift occurred to a post-capitalist vision where corporations now were supposed to have moral responsibility. The second book of truth and about neo-Marxism, cultural, uh, Maoism, and anarchy combines these themes in saying that, yes, the climate change movement, which is a lie, it's not true. It isn't true climate science. It, and yet it's a very destructive ideology which allows people to say, okay, so let's now be concerned about the poor. Let's be concerned about race discrimination. Let's be concerned about people who are marginally identified with male female sexuality and focusing on these uh, people leads to a movement you know where the poor have always been with us i mean it's it, it's biblical and taking care of the poor is a, a social responsibility but now we're transforming corporations just like the esg movement is demanding corporations have the standards of climate change, and they are internalizing the standards of climate change in order to get carbon credits. How much, how much solar and wind are you using? So out of all this whole movement, they came to say, we have to have a democratized corporation. This whole idea of democratic socialism begins to be born. In other words, it's not simply self-determination. It isn't natural rights 
objectively determined, God-given rights such as our founding fathers believed. Now it's a shift to saying we've got to feel guilty, have a moral conscience, and, and take our institutions, including corporations, to be democratized. So the democratizing capitalism movement combined with the green movement to reimagine capitalism. Uh, they, this is, again, starting with the international, uh, the, inter, uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel um, on Climate Change of the United Nations. Uh, this, the reimagining capitalism with the mission to combat global warming can be traced to the 2000, 2007, 2008 global economic collapse. From 2007 to 2008, British economist Anne Pettifor met with a group of British economists, ecologists, and environmentalists in her London flat to, quote, set out a plan for the transformation of the global economy away from addiction to, to, to fossil fuels. They called their plan the Green New Deal to echo the transformation in uh, policies that occurred in 1933 to 45 in the Roosevelt administration, Franklin Roosevelt, with, was the original Green New Deal to de deal with the poverty that occurred during the Depression. So in her 2009 book, The Case for the Green New Deal, Penafor made the case that climate concerns demand a massive and immediate government intervention in the economy. Green New Deal is a demand for a revolution in the international financial relationships, the globalized economy, and humanity's relationship to nature. We demand an end to the imperialism of the dollar, an end to the toxic ideology and institutions of capitalism based on extreme individualism, greed, consumption, and comp competition, and fueled by spiraling levels of unregulated credit. Instead, we insist and will hold the boundaries and limits imposed by the capacities of both the ecosystem and the economy, regarded as, as an urgent priority that the top 20% of the world's big emitters responsible for 70% of global emissions are made to are made to radically reduce their carbon use. Okay, so it's a totalitarian agenda from the beginning. And um, it demands that the corporations not operate for profit, but the corporations at, um, operate for achieving social justice. That's the transformation that occurred. Okay, and so now the engineering then of this global warming, I read an article today, it was, it was being circulated. There's a uh, sustainability kind of newsletter that goes around, it's called Climate, etc. And their article today is saying that um, for three decades, the reduction of carbon dioxide was the primary motivation for the transition from fossil fuels to alternative energy sources. Okay, but they're saying it's not fast enough. And they present a chart where from 6,000 BC to, you know, the current period of time, 1900s, essentially, 1700s to 1900s, but building up in 1900s, we had muscle and firewood were our primary sources of, of energy. I would also add horses and animals, etc. Then suddenly fossil fuels, there's a big spike of fossil fuels in this graph, and then they drop off because fossil fuels are going to run out. If fossil fuels came from living tissue, that argument might make some sense. But the problem is that no living tissue ever made a barrel of oil. It's, it violates the second law of thermodynamics. You can't have uh, living tissue deteriorate into a higher form of energy. We deteriorate into constituent chemicals. That's why we bury people when they die because they're gonna dis they're gonna stink in decomposition. They don't turn into oil. Uh, oil is produced naturally in the mantle of the earth. It's produced by the Fischer Tropsch equations, which the German scientists, chemists have devised in the Weimar Republic to show how oil is synthesized in the mantle of the earth. That's where the conditions exist. And it bubbles up through these chimneys in the bottom of the sea. That's been demonstrated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, which has sampled the gases coming out of these chimneys deep in the sea where there's no, there's no light. Uh, the what's coming out are hydrocarbon chains of different hydrocarbon, you know, methane, etc. Uh, hydrocarbon chains are just different combinations, chemical structures of the molecule that is methane as opposed to the, me the molecule that is butane 
And there's a whole list of these hydrocarbon chains. They're straight chains because there's no complexity in how the bonds of the atoms are together. You've just got a certain number of hydrogen, certain number of carbon in a structure of atoms that produces it to be one type of hydrocarbon or another type of hydrocarbon. But we're not running out of it. The Earth is still manufacturing it. And this insanity that we're dealing with is now architected uh, largely to destroy capitalism and to reimagine this new world. Okay, so in, in this book, I want to show how the Frankfurt School combined Marxism with Freud. Uh, so Marcuse, who was a big author, wrote Eros and Civilization in the 1960s, was very influential, said that a capitalist culture is born at the cost of repressing sexual instincts to create a subservient worker taught to believe their unfree, alienated existence is required for survival. He uh, charged that Freud sides with Thanatos, the death instinct, to protect life at the cost of enslaving Eros, Eros, E-R-O-S, love in Gr ancient Greek. Thanatos is death in ancient Greek, which Marcos, Marcus calls the living instinct, as well as characterizing, characterizing Eros as sex or love. Refusing to accept that we must be impressed to live in society, Mar Marcuse proclaimed the need for a Marxist revolution along the lines of Saul Alinsky, mixed in with Bakunin, who was a, a German thinker, who a Russian thinker rather, who um, denied the existence of God. So Marcuse wrote, culture demands continuous sub sublimination. It weakens Eros, the builder of culture, and desexualization by weakening Eros and binds the destructive impulses. Civilization is thus threatened by an instinctual diffusion in which the death instinct strives to gain ascendancy over the life instinct, originating in renunciation and development, developing under progressive renunciation, civilization tends towards self-destruction. Now, ironically, what Marcuse is aiming for is self-destruction because he wants uninhibited sexuality, sex, drugs, rock and roll. Now, if that's 100% of what you're living by, we get the following kinds of stories. We're finding that uh, we're going to have a dramatic increase in beef prices because the cattle herds are being reduced over global warming. Cars, cows fart met methane. And so therefore, they have to, we exhale carbon dioxide. This whole movement is fundamentally depopulationist. And once people get it in their minds that we've got to eliminate carbon dioxide, you begin to get AOC who's saying, you know, it's racist to use hydrocarbon fuels. And with a long chain of thinking that goes back to saying it because it, it just emphasizes greed, uh, production of material goods, which all of the communists want to say are inherently then racist, are inherently unequal, are distributed by capitalism, which abuses the poor or abuses the poor in order to live off their labor. Uh, at the bottom, when the these this Mar Marxism only destroys, it has periods of time where it comes into power, Stalin. Uh, killed millions and millions with a, his collective farm experiment, which starved millions of people. Mao did the same in the Great Leap Forward, starved millions of people. They don't care. And the idea that believing in this climate change movement is going to do good for the earth, we're going to save the planet. The planet doesn't need saving. The planet's been here 4.6 billion years. Human beings uh, have only been here a very, very short time in that in light length of the planet existing. And uh, by the way, we've had four major extinctions of everything living on Earth before human beings got here. So this whole idea that we are going to save the world by not using hydrocarbon fuels is so completely perverted that it is self-destruction. It is like, okay, so you're exhaling carbon dioxide. You know, suicide is probably a good idea then, so we eliminate the number of people, of course, we'll be dead. Uh, this whole attempt to 
produce a world without God misses the fundamental point, which is that this is a spiritual existence. We're not here permanently. There's no plan you can adopt that will permit you to, to live forever. And besides, do you really want to live forever? You know, this, this place is about acknowledging God. We're spiritual by nature. We don't know how we got here. We don't know who we really are. Don't know where Earth really is or the universe itself. But the existence is a gift of God. And it's one that God has given and bestowed in order to appreciate it's fundamental to God's existence. And in a sense, we uh, may put it as we're living in the mind of God. This is a spiritual existence. To deny God, because you can't, we can see God everywhere once you learn how. Everything's alive. Everything's got atomic structures. Everything is moving. Everything is energy, at the fundamental level. But this takes a while, and I'll probably be writing the third book here uh, in 2024 to try to express this, this set of thoughts in a coherent way. Uh, let's wrap it up before we go too long. Chris, do you want to comment? Well, as you can see, the uh, the powers that be who want to turn us into a more Marxist uh, uh, nation are have been working very hard for longer than we thought. Uh, your book does explain that and, and talks about the philosophies from the early days onward. I, I guess it's funny because back during the early Red Scare days, the uh, from the from the I, I, from the post uh, Soviet Revolution up through the thirties. Uh, people took it very seriously. It was laughed off uh, as as conspiracy during the McCarthy hearings, and that was more McCarthy's presentation and the coverage of uh, of the McCarthy hearings as well. Funny thing is, I I read uh, I forgot which Ann Coulter book described uh, how journalists were kind of joking around with each other and laughing during the hearings, and already decided it seemed that they already decided to treat this like a joke. This became a conspiracy theory. So those last fifty some odd years. I guess 60, there were like a period of 50, 60 years when most people laughed this whole thing off uh, as a conspiracy theory. Now we're seeing the fruition of all this. It was happening under our eyes. While, while many of us were working, these people on the far left were uh, infiltrating academia and the public schools. Now we have what we have. We weren't awake to it. Is it too late? Well, you can always reverse, uh, you can always reverse garbage, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> We can't travel back in time, so we have to fight it now. Well, let's wrap up today. Again, we, I apologize. We have no electricity. We're in an electrical outlet out, outage here, and I don't know what the cause of it is or when the electricity will come back. So we're improvising a bit today, but it gives us a chance to do some more of these deep dives into the fundamental issues that this show is all about. Uh, let's, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, in the end, God always wins. God will win here, too. It sometimes looks dark, and it is, and I think we're in, in, in end times. There'll be a judgment of God. We've done too much against the fundamental laws of which this place operates. But in the <clears throat> spirit of Second Chronicles 7.14, we do uh, acknowledge that our having drifted from God, and uh, God will hear our prayers and heal our land. Uh, I don't believe that we were, God created human beings to fail. I think this will be a dark period of time, but uh, there'll be a, uh, that we will emerge from here, provided enough people take seriously the types of ideas we're discussing on thetruthcentral.com. Um, thank you for joining us. This is Dr. Jerome Corsi. We're suffering through an electrical outage. I think we might as well get used to these in the age of transitioning to solar and wind. Hopefully we will awake from this nonsense before we uh, cause millions of people in the third world to die because we're not providing them the, the nitrogen fertilizers needed to feed their populations. Uh, today is um, it's Wednesday, November 15th, 2023. Uh, thank you for joining us at thetruthcentral.com. We're on many different channels, Rumble, BitChute, the upper right hand corner you can see of the website you can see all the different places where we are uh, um, thank you for joining us we'll be back tomorrow god bless <laughs>